Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Welcome once again uh, to join me as together we hear the story of how the Holy Spirit has opened someone's heart to the, to the fullness and beauty of the church. And so our guest tonight is Jeannie Ewing and she's a, what we call a revert. She's author of a book called From Grief to Grace, The Journey from Tragedy to Triumph by Sophia Press. And uh, she also has a, a website called lovealonecreates.com. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, welcome Thank you. to The Journey Home. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm anxious to hear your story from tragedy to, to triumph. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, 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 I've often said on the program that there's a, a, a verse in uh, uh, Second Corinthians that says that we're comforted that we might comfort. Yes. And so we can look at what we've gone through and praise God, we get through it by grace, but we also then by grace can say, well, maybe that's for somebody else too. Absolutely. And that's what I assume that we're here to hear about. So I'm gonna get out of the way mm -hmm. and invite you to start us on the journey. Well, you know, some people have kind of a St. Paul conversion story. Mine is more like a St. John the Apostle. It's <laughs> kind of from faith to a greater faith. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm a cradle Catholic. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised in Indiana, so a lifelong Hoosier. Okay. and I have a younger brother. And my parents were always very faithful, very devout, went to Catholic grade school and went to mass every Sunday, every holy day. But we didn't really talk about our faith at home. We just did kind of the typical bare minimum, I guess you could say. Yeah. But I had a really happy childhood. In fact, I would say when I was about five years old, one of my earliest memories was sitting in my bedroom. And I remember just thinking about heaven and the saints and the angels. And I remember her saying to God, I want to do great things for you one day. I was five. I thought everyone did something like that. I didn't know that <laughs> that was unusual. And so I always carried that. I always believed in God, always carried that deep abiding sense that he was with me and that the angels and saints were with me and our lady was with me. But, um, you know, I was recently had the privilege of being on uh, EWTN's family celebration. And mm -hmm. when I was there, mm -hmm. father, Maurice Emelou gave a talk and he talked about the blessings of being brought up in the faith as young is it's a little harder when you're older and you got a lot of baggage. But when you're young, uh, the grace of that is that, is that you, you get taught and accept things that become seeds for your life. Right. And that's what it sounds like you're saying, that you had these wonderful seeds that were there. Yes, I did. And they were planted. And they're at five years old. I mean, the idea of heaven and God and all that, just as natural as can be for you, it's life. Yes, it was. Well, I think that's probably why God allowed those seeds to be planted at such a young age, because of all the things that would happen in my family and yeah. to my husband and me when, you know, later on in life, yeah, right. which has to do with the tragedy and triumph. Right. So I never questioned my faith until I went to high school because I had been surrounded by Catholics in my Catholic grade school. They were all my friends, families hung out together. And my parents gave me a choice at my eighth grade graduation. You can either attend the public high school or you can go to the Catholic high school. And I don't know why, but I chose to go to the public high school. Hmm. And it was a culture shock. Yeah. So I had gone from this very small, close-knit Catholic community to huge, very diverse public school. And I kind of felt like a lamb thrown among the wolves because the first day of school, two lockers down from me was an avid open Satanist. He wore the pentagram to school, wore all black, and I was just kind of, and he brought the Satan Bible to school, and I just thought, what am I gonna do? So. Well, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last thing I wanna do is, is uh, to, to cast aspersions or stand in judgment of your folks and the decision mm -hmm. they made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that they, they just said, okay, at eighth grade, I'll let you make the choice. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Don't know why. I mean, was that kind of a, an expression of the state of the, of the faith of the family at the time? I mean, I know you were doing the externals of the Catholic mm -hmm. faith, but I, I don't want to. You know, I don't know exactly because I, when when I graduated, so between eighth grade and freshman year of high school, so it was shortly after they had asked me to make this decision. My mom went on a pilgrimage, mm -hmm. 
and it completely changed her life. Oh, praise God. Okay. So she came back that summer and she wanted to start praying the family rosary and um, she was going to daily mass and she was encouraging us as a family to go to adoration. And so this was a huge transformation in the culture of my family. Okay. And that was a little bit after this yeah. happened. So okay. it may have been indicative of that, but I think, you know, especially my father, he has always been solid, always yep. been faithful. And he's more private about his faith, but my mom was a child of the 60s and she <laughs> left the church for quite a while and had been married and then divorced and then annulled and then mm -hmm. she met my dad. Yeah. My dad though, never, never left the church. Okay. He was always solid. So I think my parents, what influenced my Catholic faith and my upbringing was probably from my parents' influence because they were both raised in homes where one parent was a Catholic and one was a Protestant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the way my mom was raised, it was like, if you're not Catholic, you're going to hell. You know, that's what she heard, the message she heard at Catholic school. And so my parents were very careful to instill a different message for my brother and me that, no, your grandpa and your grandma, they're very faithful people. They just don't believe the same things that we do. Right. So well, I that's never... That's a medical perspective. Yeah. And that might have opened them up to... And again, we can't say in general, as you go across the country, that uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you choose pro uh, uh, public school or Catholic school. It depends on where you're at. And maybe from her perspective, there's two good options. I'll let you decide. And yes, and the school that I attended was actually one of the best in okay. the city. So, um, but it was definitely difficult for me in terms well, of culture shock. Well, my faith. Yeah. So none of my friends were Catholic that I became close friends with mm -hmm. at, this, at the public high school. And in fact, many of them started asking me questions that most Catholics hear, you know, why do you pray to Mary? Why do you kneel at certain times? Why do you do the sign of the cross? All these things. Isn't it just about rituals? And I didn't know how to answer those questions. <laughs> Sadly, you know, even though I had a solid eight years in grade school of religious education, I wasn't well catechized. Yeah. And so, I didn't know what to say, and in fact, some of their arguments against Catholicism were very convincing to me. And so by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was actually very determined to go find out if there was some other Christian denomination that was meant for me. Now this is interesting because I never went completely off of the spectrum of Christianity. So I always knew there was a triune God. I always mm. believed in the Trinity, and um, I knew that Christianity was my home. I just didn't know which denomination. Yeah. So it was that age where I really started to question. And I think this is where I really give my parents great credit because I don't know that I would be a strong Catholic if they had not done this. I went to them one day and my best friend at the time and I wanted to start going kind of church hopping. And she was raised Lutheran. Excuse me. Bless you. Sorry. And so um, we started going to her church, a Missouri Synod church, and then she wanted to go to this mega big, you know, one of those mega churches. I think it was like non-denominational or right. something. And we had some friends that were Assembly of God, blah, blah, blah. So we went to different denominations and we kind of went to their services. But my parents said, you can do that as long as you still go to mass on Sunday, mm -hmm. every Sunday with the family. Mm -hmm. And even though my heart wasn't really in it, I agreed to that. It was probably the Holy Spirit because I was in a place that my, in my life where I was kind of rebellious and I otherwise wouldn't have agreed to that. So um, during that time, you know, I was into that feel good faith surrounded by all these teenagers that were, that loved God. And it was so different than the apathy I saw at my public high school. And I really loved that. And because I still had that seed from five years old, this yeah. deep longing to know God and to know truth and to follow him, I felt like I was among like-minded teenagers. And I don't know, this lasted several months. And then I don't know what happened specifically that made me question if this was really where my heart was, these mm -hmm. other Christian denominations. But I do remember kind of getting a little disillusioned when people would ask me if I'd been saved. Yes, I'd been baptized, convert. they didn't understand any of that. And then some people would say, oh, do you wanna to go to the altar call today? And I'm like, I don't really understand what this is about. And I started to get a little uncomfortable with those things. But what really did it was, there was one particular evening service at the mega church that I was going with my friends. And they were, it was communion Sunday. And I was shocked that they didn't have communion every week and that this was, I mean, I thought, why do it at all if you're just going to 
once a month and make it kind of a big deal, but it's really supposed to be a bigger deal than that. And at the time, I didn't really <laughs> fully understand the Eucharist, but I did understand it was a central tenet of our faith as a Catholic. I just didn't know it was really Jesus. And so um, they passed around this tray, little cups of grape juice and little wafers, and I declined just very politely, quietly, and the usher was very persistent with me. And it became kind of a, a small scene. Everyone around us turned around, looked at me, kind of prompting me and urging me, and I, I just, no thank you. I just knew, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to at that age, but I didn't. There was something in me, likely the Holy Spirit, that was really helping me to refrain from that because I felt like it was, a cheap imitation, but I didn't know why. I was so confused in this moment. And so after this happened, I was embarrassed and I felt really like I was wrestling with something. And I just remember going home and praying, Lord, I want you to show me the truth. Where is my home? Where is home for me, for, for church? And, and I, I kind of carried that question like a heavy load that whole week. And when I went to mass, as usual with my parents the next Sunday, I started to cry because I just felt so alone and so lost. And then I remember it was the consecration. Are you sharing this with anybody else? Or was it was just in here. It was just in my heart. I was just yeah. talking with the okay. Lord about it. Right. And so um, I remember it was during the consecration. I lifted my eyes, and it was like you know, like the scales that fell from the blind man's eyes. <laughs> it was like something, like a veil had been lifted. And I saw Jesus, not literally, but I knew it was him. I knew that Jesus, his body, blood, soul, and divinity was what was missing from these other faiths. And I knew that that was why I couldn't partake and participate in an other type of communion service. And right. so recognizing Jesus was almost like seeing him face to face in such an intimate way in my soul that I instantly knew this is home. I was flooded with peace. I cried tears of joy. I received the Eucharist in a very um, grateful and humble manner that day. And that was really a turning point for me because then I left all those other youth groups behind. I lost some friends, uh, but I was very zealous and very excited to learn more about why the Catholic Church is the fullness of truth. Our guest is Jeannie Ewing. Um, it, you know, it's one thing to read all the apologetics, you know, about the Eucharist and what the church teaches. And it's possible that a person can uh, see the biblical arguments from John 6, uh, can read the early church fathers on the Eucharist, mm -hmm. can, can get all that. And still it could, it could remain up here and not be here. And it sounds like what the Holy Spirit gave you in that gift of that moment mm -hmm. was here. Exactly. Was, exactly. an, was an awareness of the reality of Jesus. Yes. You may not have been able to explain transubstantiation, mm -hmm. but you knew that was him. That's right. And then I found out later my parents had been praying for me <laughs> because they had gone to my Catholic youth minister when I had come to them requesting that I could go to these other churches. And they said, we're really worried that Jeannie's gonna leave the Catholic church. And um, my youth minister said, you know, she'll come back. Mm -hmm. Just give her some time. And so, that's why I really thank my parents, because I think because I went through that experience, it made Catholicism so much more of a treasure to me, especially entering the kind of tumultuous years of young adulthood. So around this age, sophomore, junior in high school, when I had this epiphany, and I became more involved with the Catholic youth group at my church and um, joining Catholic Bible studies and, and meeting you know, like-minded Catholic teenagers was so refreshing. Well, at the same time, uh, we had a family member, a cousin of my mom's who was addicted to drugs. And she was really close to my mom. My mom is an only child. Mm -hmm. And so she was almost like a sister to my mom. And she was starting to come over in the middle of the night and ask for money. And my parents initially gave her some and then realized what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so it really scared me to see the change, that shift in this really beautiful, intelligent woman mm -hmm. into skin and bones, homeless on the street. She had lost her family and everything. Well, um, mm -hmm. shortly after that, my younger brother was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And he had been diagnosed at a younger age with obsessive compulsive disorder. But that was a really hard time in my family too because it was, it was like the reality of suffering mm -hmm. was bringing those questions to my, the forefront of my mind. 
why does God allow suffering? Some of these common questions yeah. that people who question the existence of God even ask. Why would a good God, a benevolent God, allow this? And so I was starting to kind of wrestle with that, but was still kind of egocentric enough as a teenager to do my own thing, so to speak. But it was very, well, it's very still real. tough questions for a teenager to deal with. It anyway. really, it really I mean, is. Yeah. 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 And so um, that really did influence the seeds that had been planted at a young age that were part of my faith journey. Because when I um, graduated college, I had been dating a young man in the um, Marine Corps, and we were engaged to be married, but he was an atheist. So, you know, again, I had to come back to what is really important to me? Can I really spend the rest of my life with somebody who is not even Christian, let alone not Catholic? And you must have dealt with that for a while if you got to the point of being engaged. You know, did, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, did you talk faith at all? Oh, absolutely. Just... So at this point in my life in college, I was a daily mass goer, daily adoration goer, praying the rosary daily. There were a lot of people at my home parish that were nudging me to become a religious sister. And I had discerned that that was not my vocation. I had spent some time in different religious communities with some sisters and um, I just wow. knew okay. that it was, <laughs> It was my calling to be married. Yep. But another thing that I think maybe was kind of a spiritual block as to why I couldn't see clearly that the gentleman I was dating was not a good fit for me for marriage yeah. was there was a, a point in time when I was younger that I dabbled in the occult. I knew it was wrong. My parents had told me before they ever knew I did any of this stuff. They're like, never play the Ouija board, don't do any, it's not a game. Mm -hmm. And what happened, I was with some of my Catholic friends, it was like a sleepover that we had as girls, and they brought a Ouija board out. And I was really scared, but I played it, because I was curious. And when I played it, it started spelling really horrible words. And I asked the question, do you believe in God? And it spelled yes. And then I said, do you, do you worship God? And it spelled no, Satan. And from that point on, I realized that I had opened a portal to something that was really serious and really dangerous. So even though I had been brought up with a really solid Christian, Catholic Christian foundation, I had made this choice. And I think that's because I was younger, I didn't fully understand all the consequences or implications, especially sure. spiritually. Was, did, had this event happened before you had done your exploring of the other Christian faiths? Shortly before. Shortly before mm -hmm. that. So I mean, it mm -hmm. was a time when, when, yeah, the doors were being opened uh, to challenge the seeds that had been planted yes. in your life earlier. Yes, yeah. and so some very, this and this was long term. So when I opened that door by playing the Ouija board, there were some very serious consequences spiritually that happened in my family of origin. Mm. Some things that some just really, um, really sad and scary and oppressive, spiritually oppressive mm. things that happen. And so that's when I realized with great remorse, oh, I've got to do something. And so all of these things kind of coalesced at the same time that revelation at mass where I knew that this was Jesus in the Eucharist, and then also realizing that I needed to confess and repent of this involvement with the occult, because it was more than once that I played the Ouija board, and then did some other, like numerology and um, um, some astrological participation, just dabbling, but yeah. it was serious enough that it was, and I knew it was wrong. So I did confess it, and you know, like I said, there was a season in college where it was like the springtime of my faith. Everything was beautiful and new, and the Lord gave me lots and lots of consolations. So very, a lot of sweetness that was happening then. And, you know, looking back, I can see he was preparing me with those consolations for the period of trial and testing and tribulation. And so... Um, so you're, you're engaged to this man that it isn't of your faith. Right. Even though you, you decided through discerning or even religious life, you said, no, I'm called to be married, but, but is this the right... Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I think because of that involvement with the occult, I could not clearly see that he was not right for me. Um, hmm. And I pushed aside. Actually, the Lord spoke very clearly to me in prayer one, time, one day. He said, do not marry this man. And I just, I was scared I would never m marry anybody who was 
I guess what the image I had conjured in my mind of who I really thought would be right for me, I just kind of succumbed to, well, I think this is just the way it's going to be. <laughs> and so I, I actually, you know, I disobeyed God there because I knew it was him saying that to me. And I just pushed it aside, ignored it. And then um, finally we did break it off and I had just sunk into this really dark place. I, I just kind of lost focus on what my purpose and my mission in life really was. Mm -hmm. I had always wanted to go to college, graduate, get married, have a family, and it just didn't happen like that. So I graduated from college and I thought, now what do I do? Uh, I have kind of a mediocre job and I still live with my parents, but marriage is not on the horizon and I just, I was really depressed. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped going to daily mass and I stopped praying the rosary every day and I kind of gradually slipped away into a place where I just, I think I allowed the enemy to just really get me discouraged and despondent. I was never in despair, but very much on the cusp of despair. Had you quit talking to God altogether? No, and that's something that I tell people, especially in my book too, is I think that's what's beautiful about an intimate faith with God is that we can talk to him about everything. We can be angry with him even. And as long as we're still having that dialogue with him, we're st we still know he's there and we still are talking to him and listening to him. That's what matters. So I, I was still talking to God, but I was mad. And at this time, the cousin who was on drugs, she had died from a heart failure related to drug wow. usage. And I saw the grief that that placed on my mom, and especially my mom. My brother was also really struggling in school, um, and I saw the, the suffering and the struggle with my parents, with, with my brother. And, and then I went through a period of time where I thought, I've got to get back into listening to God's voice, because no matter where I am in my life, and no matter how discouraged I am, I have to find out what's next. So then I started gradually going back to adoration and back to daily mass. And I decided that I was just going to be single for whatever period of time God wanted me to be single. And even though all my friends were getting married, um, I was just gonna learn what the grace of this moment was about. <laughs> so um, because I had had a series of failed relationships, so I was engaged to this guy and then I had dated two other gentlemen that led close to engagement. My mom suggested that I join a um, dating website, a Catholic dating website, and I thought, and this was back when it was still kind of taboo to do that. Okay. So I was very reluctant. I thought, I am not going to do that. That is so desperate. I don't feel like that's a, I just feel like that's kind of putting me out there and making it seem like I really want to find somebody to get mar to marry. But because she wouldn't leave me alone, she was very persistent, I did it. And there were some very interesting characters that I met. So then by the time I, I met Ben, <laughs> who is you, my husband. Being kind? I, I am, yeah, there, that was a, there's some stories there that were very funny. But um, by the time I met Ben, I was, a, I was very much disenchanted with the whole idea. And I just was being polite at this point. So he had emailed me and wanted to talk. I thought, oh gosh, it's another one. But I was very polite. And it's so beautiful how God works because this courtship unfolded. He lived 1,500 miles away in New Mexico. Whoa. And he was asking me really important questions that I thought, oh, no one's ever asked me these things before. It's not just about, you know, the superficial interests that you have or where you like to go out to dinner or things like your favorite movie. These are like really important questions about faith and raising family, a family together. And I could tell that he really was trying to discern if he wanted to get married or who he wanted to marry. And so after 10 months or so, and he had come to visit my family and I went to visit Ben's family a few times, we knew that we were meant to be married. And so this was another aspect of my faith journey because with some of the suffering that had begun in my family, so some of the repercussions from me dabbling in the occult, my brother's disease, um, my cousin who died of drug overdose, and then I had a couple of other friends that died from substance abuse problems. Um, there was just like this moment of flourishing in, my, in our faith when I met Ben and when we married. The, our wedding day was like heaven to me. 
it, there were all the people we loved who were in one place and we were celebrating the sacrament, the nuptial mass. He, he was Catholic? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. So I, I did join this Catholic website. Yeah. So, oh, sure, okay. Yeah, yes, right. yes. Because at this point I knew that I couldn't marry somebody who wasn't. Okay. I couldn't. So um, the fact that Ben and I had everything that matched all of our hopes and dreams, all of our religious and um, philosophical and political ideology, everything matched. It was so refreshing. There was, there was no arguing about children or natural family planning or anything like that. It was just all there. And so we really built a friendship that w that's remained to this day. We're best friends, very strong. So um, Ben and I had kind of a sense when we were early newlyweds that we were going to have a cross to carry in our marriage that was very specific, but we didn't really know what that would be. But I'm going to pause there then. Sure. It sounds like a good place to pause okay. because uh, uh, Jeannie, it sounds like you know, through rough and st you still got some uh, issues that are uh, you know, baggage, in other words, the death of friends and, and family and the, the, the diddling there with the, with you called. But, uh, but you've landed on both feet with a wonderful husband, and it seems like everything's coming together. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pause and let's find out how the Lord leads you from there, all right? Come back in just a moment. See. Welcome back to Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is Jeannie Ewing, author of From Grief to Grace by Sophia Press. And uh, we paused you right in the middle there. Sounds like everything's going great with you and your and your new husband, Ben. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Did you uh, stay in Fort Wayne or did you go to? We moved to Amish country in Indiana, Goshen, oh, the Goshen area. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were the Why that? Catholics. Because of my husband's job. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, after we were married, I couldn't get pregnant, and so infertility was part of that cross. And I had gone to my Creighton doctor, my husband and I used the Creighton method for uh, natural family planning, and you know did all these tests, I was on progesterone therapy, everything like that, but I truly didn't know if I was ever going to biologically be able to have a child. Mm. And so that was another period of my life where I was in this dark place because I felt very strongly called to motherhood. And all my friends that had been married before I were now having babies. And I was in charge of helping with baby showers and it was very, very painful. Mm. So during this time I started volunteering at our church and kind of utilizing that spiritual motherhood at that point that I knew I had to share mm -hmm. at that point in my life. And so I volunteered, my husband and I both did for our youth group, and then we taught the baptism class, and then my husband became a lector, and um, I started going to spiritual direction, my pastor, and I shared with him about these struggles, and he recommended reading St. John of the Cross. Yeah. And so I bought this very old weathered tome of the collected works of St. John of the Cross and I just started reading it with no one to help me. And surprisingly, or maybe providentially, I understood it. Huh. And of course I could read it again. I've read it a couple of times and I always glean something different and new. Right. But um, that was very pivotal in my spiritual journey because for the first time in my life, I saw th this explanation of the mystery of maybe holy darkness as being a gift, and so the dark night of the soul. And it was beautiful, it was very consoling again to me. Mm -hmm. But I do remember there was a point, and this was shortly became, before I became pregnant with my first daughter, um, I was looking at a picture that we had had since we were married that was hanging up in our living room. And so I had seen it you know, hundreds of times, and for some reason, when I saw it this particular time, it was like the Lord spoke to me through this image. So what it is is a lighthouse at night, and there are two hands, presumably God's, and then there's a storm. And I just, the message that I received with seeing this picture was that the Lord was asking me to embrace the dark night of the soul the, that was about to come. And in fact, I heard 
him ask me specifically, will you accept the cross that I have in mind for you? Of course, you know, this little voice in my heart. And at first I hesitated and I was like, oh, what's that going to mean? And, but he, the Lord as he is, was very gentle with me, of course. And so. But it, I can't, uh, I can't uh, avoid hearing the parallel in that of Our Lady asking the little children at Fatima, can you accept mm -hmm. suffering? Mm -hmm. yeah, Which I mean. didn't think about that at the mm -hmm. time. Right. I was just in the midst asked. of this. Yeah. And I, I thought about it for maybe a day and it was very much on my heart. And then I realized I can't refuse God. I was very terrified because I knew it was going to be something specific. Again, mm. this went back to the early days of my marriage where Ben and I just had a knowledge of some sort that there was going to be a specific cross. So then I became a mom to our beautiful daughter, Felicity, and um, which the Lord named her, actually. <laughs> and so becoming a mother was another particular cross because Felicity screamed all the time and she was inconsolable whether she was mm -hmm. eating or going to bed or getting her clothes changed or taking a bath. And I knew in my gut something wasn't right, but the doctor was kind of labeling me as this neurotic first time mom. And so I didn't really get any help until she was almost a year and a half old and she still wasn't even crawling. And so through the early childhood intervention program in Indiana, which is called First Steps, we got some help with physical therapy for her. And it was her physical therapist that said, you know, I think she might have some sensory issues. And I thought, what the heck is that? And my husband and I read this book that was recommended to us and we understood sensory processing disorder as a neurological condition. Mm -hmm. So we got her tested for that, and then she got some occupational therapy. Basically, it means that the brain doesn't process sensory information like it would in a typical person. And it's different for different people that have SPD, is what they call it. So for Felicity, it was tactile, and that's why she wasn't crawling, because she didn't like the way the carpet felt or the grass or anything like that. And we didn't know it, yeah, and she couldn't well, say it. Yeah, right. right. So that was a, another step towards this, this journey because I felt guilty as a mother. I thought, what did I do wrong? And then I had all these friends that had these healthy, typical babies and I felt kind of alone. And at the same time, I felt like the Lord was saying, I gave you the personality I gave you so that you could do the best possible care or provide that or find it for your children to thrive. And so I just kind of, it was a humbling moment, which is not my strong suit, it's humility. And I just thought, you know what, whether or not it's something I did or didn't do, I'm going to just get help for her. So then um, my husband and I, I got pregnant with our middle daughter. Uh, that was really no problem. I mean, it wasn't as long of an infertility bout. I had to have some treatments with progesterone therapy. But um, that was a very joyful pregnancy because I just, I knew what the blessing was of our first child. And so I really had no worries and it was all about enjoying this little life inside of me. And all of my ultrasounds were healthy and great and everything. And so when I went into labor in the hospital and everything progressed beautifully up until a certain point, I just was elated. I was euphoric. And then it reached a point where it was what they called fetal distress. And so uh, Sarah, her heart rate was going up way too high, it was skyrocketing. And um, my doctor said, I think you're gonna have to have a C-section, which was at that time one of my deepest, darkest fears because of the stories I had heard from friends. Mm -hmm. And I had been in labor maybe 26 hours at this point. So Whoa. I started sobbing and sobbing. And this um, OBGYN whom I had never met before, a female, um, she came in and she calmed me down and kind of explained what was gonna happen. And I was so scared. And my husband said, I don't know what to do, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I'm here for you, which was exactly what I needed. Yeah. But this is what's really amazing, which is, contributes to this cross, but also the faith and how loving God is, even in our suffering, especially in our suffering. So in this moment where I just was losing my grip on hope altogether, I felt the Lord say to me, say a prayer to Father Solanus Casey. I had not thought of Father Solanus Casey in years. And in fact, most people at this point in time didn't even know who he was. Right. So 
I don't know, it was like this light bulb, and I did. All I said was, Father Solanus, please be with me. Please help me through this. And I said it very quickly and silently in my heart. And then they wheeled me into the OR. Well, when, when um, Sarah came out, there was a hush over the room, and I was still kind of woozy from the anesthetic. And then the pediatrician came over and said, do you have any genetic conditions in your family? And I said, no, why? And my husband's like, no. Well, he walked over and saw Sarah. Sarah had this protruding forehead and buggy eyes, and her hands were, f her fingers were fused together. It looked like little mittens. You could tell something was not right. And nobody knew what it was. So Ben and I, you know, I went to the recovery room. We cried together. The doctor surmised that it was something called Apert syndrome, which is a rare genetic condition. But here's what's really beautiful. When the OBGYN who did the surgery came to check on me, you could see the awe in her face. She was awestruck. She did not know me. And you have to remember too, in medicine, it's kind of iffy and touchy to talk about God, right? She, had, she was completely unabashed about this. She came up to me and she said, everybody in the OR today felt the presence of God in that room. And she said, this has never happened to me. I've delivered babies in the Bronx and I've had parents walk away from their kids when they see something like this. And she said, but when I reached in your womb, I felt God's hand take over and deliver your child. Oh. And she just went on, I'm almost kind of a prophetic word. She was quoting scripture and saying how our daughters were going to be these beautiful children of God and they were gonna do great things for the Lord one day and that we don't realize how blessed we are. And she didn't know me. So I was shocked because I thought, I was really, I admired her for being so bold and not caring if I was offended or not. And of course I wasn't, I was so grateful. But that was mingling with this grief because when my husband and I figured out what Apert syndrome was, um, and which is still somewhat nebulous, a little bit mysterious, but it's it, generally speaking, people with Apert have between 12 or 20 and 60 surgeries throughout their life. Oh. So Sarah's had six, so she'll probably have a oh. dozen more plus. For um, physical anomalies? Yeah, it's, it can affect every system of the body, but okay. the, main, the most, I guess, imminent surgeries that have to happen right away are to separate the skull, which is prematurely fused, and then separate the fingers so that the fine motor yeah. skills can form. But there are other issues, um, walking, so she has to wear orthotics, she has to have physical and occupational therapy. Oh. And so we knew at this point that this was going to be a lifelong cross for her and for us yeah. and for our older daughter, Felicity. Um, and that was hard for us. We cried a lot. And it was probably in the two weeks following Sarah's birth that I had wrestled with all those early questions of faith. Why does God allow suffering? Why is this happening? I had had friends who had babies the same week that I did. Healthy, typical babies. So I was, you know, I was kind of, you know, shaking my fist at the Lord and I was really mad. Why did you give this to us and her? And, and then, you know, Felicity's going to have to deal with kind of living in Sarah's shadow, so to speak, because Sarah's gonna have to have all this attention. Right. And um, the things that people said that were not helpful were the things that you think might be helpful, like everything happens for a reason and God gives special children to special parents, and I hated hearing that. I was polite in response, but I was fuming on the inside when people would say those things to me. But what I didn't realize in those- They're trying to be. Kind They're trying to be helpful. It's, it's not helpful. <laughs> so I think what was most helpful was one of my friends who lived two houses down. She'd come over and she'd say, Jeannie, I don't know what this is like for you, but I'm here. And she'd just sit on the couch with me and listen mm -hmm. and let me cry or let me be mad. And she was okay with that. So she was comfortable with me being in a very fragile and raw emotional state. <laughs> So there came a point after Sarah's birth where I knew I was heading on this path to embitterment. I saw it. Um, the anger, which I was still talking to God, but I was no longer as open to accepting the mystery of suffering. Um, this was not the life I wanted, not the life we chose. It was really hard on my marriage because men and women deal with grief differently. Yeah. My husband, uh, and also personality differences, so he wanted to become more private, retreat inward. I needed to talk about it. So that was very much a trial in our marriage. 
And yet there was a moment where again, I felt the Lord speak to me. Do you trust me with your daughter? And I said, yeah, I was kind of <laughs> answering automatically. And it's like when he asked Peter three times. So Jesus asked me three times, do you trust me with your daughter? And three times I said yes, but the third time I thought, <laughs> okay, there must be a reason he's you know, reiterating this so many times. And so I was more confident in my yes. And so after I said that yes with faith the third time, I felt that Jesus was saying to me, you can choose victimhood or victory, and victory can only come through the cross. It cannot come any other way. And so there was this point where I felt like, like those walls of bitterness were eroding around my heart at that moment, and there was some healing grace that permeated. And I said, yes, I will carry the cross, and I will accept the mystery. And it was shortly after that that this book came to fruition, uh, which was a lifelong dream of mine, was to write and have a book published. <laughs> talking about the dark night of the soul and certain spiritual tenets and Father Solanus Casey, things I had learned along my journey, my faith journey, that I had no idea God was preparing me for something like this yep. that could then go forth, like you said in the beginning, and help other people. Right. Right. The, um, how do you describe, you described it, but how do you describe the trust that when, when you know God is asking you questions, you know God's leading you, God's pulling you forward, you know, like you said, this was the Lord speaking to me. It, it doesn't come down in stone tablets. Right. You know, it doesn't always a voice, you can hear it, but yet you know mm -hmm. that it's God's voice leading you forward. It seemed like that's always been a big part of your spiritual mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. I think I just knew because there was peace that accompanied that message, yeah. that thought, and there was also courage to do whatever God was asking me to do. And I knew very much that it was a choice. It was always free will. And I also knew that God would never love me less if I said no. I knew that in those moments. But I also wanted to do what would console him, what would please him. And so that's why I did it. But it was very much the grace that was specific was the fruit of it was peace. And then he gave me the courage and the strength to say yeah. yes. You know, trusting that God is going to be there tomorrow, a month, a year, when you don't know how things will go with a child that has problems. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, God is saying, do you trust me? Will you trust me with this? And you want to say yes. And then there's the spiritual battle that's like, ah, you know, uh, it's easy to say that but it's going to get, it might get worse, mm -hmm. it might get tough. Uh, be, you know, letting go of that seed of bitterness is not easy. Right. Because it, it doesn't just stop. Right. As soon as you say, I trust, and then okay, that's good, it, it's gravy. No, it is, it's accepting um, that you're letting go of the control of tomorrow into his hands. Yep. Yep. I think it's good you mentioned the spiritual battle part too, because I think some of this was spiritual oppression. After I had Sarah and, and before I was pregnant with Veronica, which is our newborn baby, um, I have a friend who I had not seen in a long time, and she said to me kind of a prophetic word. She said, I don't, I think that some of this oppression that you're feeling and experiencing might be spiritual warfare. And that kind of took me aback because I thought, oh, I thought I dealt with all of that, you know, the occult, the dabbling in yeah. the occult and everything. And she also said that Veronica, my baby, that um, she would show me God's mercy and love. So Ben and I and our girls, we just moved a few months ago. And after we moved, we had an enthronement to the Sacred Heart in our home. Mm -hmm. And after that, Veronica was born. And then in the middle of the night when I'd get up to feed her, I'd sit in front of that image of Jesus. And I'd pour my heart out to him. And it was the first time in my life that I think I experienced his humanity. And that was consoling to me, but then I wanted to console him too. And after this happened, one of my friends, who's also a Catholic writer, um, she's trained in deliverance, lay deliverance ministry. And she's actually friends, uh, she and her friend do this together. They are friends with their exorcist in their diocese. And some conversation we had, I have no idea what it was, brought this up, my past with the occult. And then um, we also have Freemasonry in my family. And 
so about a month ago, I sat down and we went through the actual official renunciation, denouncing mm -hmm. the evil that my ancestors had chosen for my family and that mm -hmm. I had chosen. I mean, not not chosen like I wanted evil. There was still that innocence, like you mentioned, as yeah. a child, but at the same time, I had made a choice. And so I had to close the door that I had opened. And I didn't know that. I thought just going to confession and living my life, that everything would be gone, that the residual effects of the spiritual oppression, and it wasn't. And so it wasn't until after the Sacred Heart of Jesus became this central part of our heart and our home and our family that the, my story, my faith journey has kind of come full circle mm -hmm. to a place where I really feel liberated from this weight that's kind of been on my mm -hmm. shoulders for decades, that um, it's now, it's gone, because I actually went through the act of saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce dabbling in the occult, playing the Ouija board, and, and, uh... But you know what the biggest danger is? Just about the time you tell a few people, now things are going great, that's when we give permission to the enemy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the battle doesn't stop. Mm -hmm, that's right. exactly right. The so the spiritual attack doesn't stop, but I don't feel the immediate sense of discouragement and despondency that I would before. Yeah. There's still a battle, but there's very much more um, clarity in how to approach it for me, yeah. if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, in fact, I just mentioned this in the, the talk that I gave for the family celebration that in John 15, in that wonderful passage about the vine and the branches, we're very familiar with that, everybody mm -hmm. is. But he talks in there about if, if we don't produce fruit, we're cast off as branches. But if we do produce fruit, we're pruned. Yes. Which, wait a second, you know, I'm, I'm doing good things here. Why? What, what's the pruning all about? Yes. Well because he wants us to produce more fruit, mm -hmm. better fruit, more virtuous fruit. And so uh, about the time things start going well, that's grace, but prudence is still awaiting us, yes. which was a little bit of what John the Cross was talking about, that the darkness can be a good thing. Yes. Talk about that a little bit, because that's a bit of a mystery to people. You would think, so many Christians think, if I have good faith in Jesus, then everything's going to be great. Right. And even a lot of Catholics think that, yeah. too. Um, the dark night of the soul is almost akin to maybe a tomb. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of waiting. It's a holding place, a pattern maybe. But it's a place where the Lord is so intimately with you and you can't see him. You can't feel him. You don't necessarily have any consolations or signs or any kinds of spiritual sweetness at all. In fact, you might even feel like he's forsaken you. Like when Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You feel that, that sense of loss, but yet the longing for him is so much greater. And so this is, that's kind of where that pruning comes into place. The Lord is specifically pruning that person's soul mm -hmm. for something greater, for greater spiritual fruit and, and um, grace and so that they can glorify him even more. But they don't feel it. They feel the pain. They feel the, like pruning a branch. They cut off the branch and that hurts the, the tree or the bush, but yet, or the vine. But yet, without that, then it would just kind of wither over time. So that's kind of what the dark night is. It is a mystery, but it's, that's something I think that's important for everybody, myself included, because it's still an ongoing process, is to accept that suffering is a mystery. And we don't have to have the answers. We don't have to know why. We just have to say yes, and then walk with the Lord hand in hand to wherever he's leading us. Yeah, our Lord said, look to the birds, and a little bird can't learn to fly unless it's kicked out of its nest. Mm -hmm. And it was comfy, and it was happy, and it was content, it was being fed, everything was just beautiful. But there's something he doesn't even understand yet that's better. Yes. And you can't get there until you're kicked out of the nest. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little bit of the dark night. God wants to stretch us. Yes. Okay. And uh, to get to that stretching involves being willing to obey and be open to grace and to respond to that grace and to grow. But that journey, as you were told a long time ago, it might involve some suffering. Yeah. Are you willing to accept that? Yeah. I think all of our lives involve suffering. Yeah. We just have different crosses and they happen at different times. Right. Well, it says in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 10, that you know, we're tempted, but he doesn't allow us to be tempted beyond yes. 
but she knows us better than we know ourselves. So there's grace there. We pray for that grace. Mm -hmm. We have an email, Lou from Denver writes, in Jeannie's faith journey, how has the church's teaching on suffering and the intimate connection to the Christian life begun to make sense to her? It's so easy to buy into the prosperity gospel notion that if we are faithful Christians, we won't have bad things happen to us. Just kind of what we were talking about. Yeah. So how has my understand my Catholic understanding of yeah. suffering contributed to my faith journey? Well, certainly I had known nominally what redemptive suffering was. I had grown up hearing, well, offer it up, offer it up, that kind of thing. But it wasn't until I, I kind of learned, well, what does suffering well look like? It's not just begrudgingly saying, okay, fine, I'll endure this headache and I'll give it to Jesus for whatever he wants. It's more about love. Mm -hmm. So to me, understanding suffering is more about me desiring to be so close to Jesus that I will endure whatever it takes for his sake, for the sake of other souls, for the, my own sanctification. And you can't do that without encountering intimately and, and more than once so frequently, the cross. You can't do that. It's impossible to get to the resurrection, the prosperity gospel. It's impossible to get there and skip the passion. We all have our own passion journey and story. And so it's really more about embracing the suffering, entering into it with the Lord and knowing that he may not take the suffering away, even if we give it to him and pray and pray and ask for this and that to change. He may not take that that pain away, but he will tr transform it into love. And that's what happened to me. Yeah, sacrifice has always been an important part of religion in all cultures. And what is sacrifice? You take a little bit of what's valuable to you and you give it to God. And you don't always understand how that's going to change things, but that's up to him. Right. It's up to him, but it's letting go of it into his care. Well, that's offering it up. Yes. You're, you're giving it to him. Yeah. As opposed to holding on to it, I'm going to fix it, or yeah. I don't understand this, or I'm angry about this, you know. No, Lord. Or, as it says in that big poster, Jesus, I trust in you. Mm -hmm. Divine mercy. Mm -hmm. I trust in you. That's letting go in the midst of all that. And then you invite the battle. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll see. Uh, you know, God's going to see if, if it's real, and so is the enemy. Mm -hmm. I trust in you, Lord. I trust in you. Mm -hmm. Another email, Dale from the East Coast. Uh, what encouragement would Jeannie give someone who is going through a difficult and painful time in life uh, with lots of family and marriage issues? My friend is discouraged and I don't want him to give a, up on his faith in God. Do you have any ideas for how to help him keep a positive outlook and encourage his faith, even when God doesn't seem to be present in his life. I kind of talk about that in my book. Okay. There are six spiritual principles that I mention. It sounds to me like his friend is going through grief, chronic grief. Okay. So I kind of um, explain how grief and suffering interlock or overlap sometimes. And um, there are six different processes that have to do with humility and uh, holy indifference, so an Ignatian principle of uh, praying but not expecting a certain outcome mm -hmm. and, and allowing the Lord to bless the, the answer in whatever way he wants and we remain at peace and content with that. There's also abandoning all, surrender to God's providence. And um, I also talk a little bit about some mystical theology from St. Therese, the wound of the heart. And so that's where I think someone who is suffering a great deal and has this, this mystical wound, this pain in the heart, can find that that's actually probably one of the greatest gifts that he or she could give to mm -hmm. the Lord is our misery and our, our pain. Because when we unite our wounds into his wounds, they, they mingle together in a way that we don't, it's not about how we feel and it's not even necessarily about circumstances changing. It's about the refinement of our souls so that we become holy and that we learn that suffering's not the end. So I guess the hope part would be to focus on the fact that resurrection does come for every person, but we have to go through the, the thorns and brambles to get All there. All right, well, it sounds like 
again, uh, a reminder to the audience about your book, uh, From Grief to Grace, The Journey from Tragedy to Triumph, uh, Sophia Press, and uh, as a good encouragement for them to deal with some of these main issues. If they're out there dealing with some of the issues you went through, that, that's what this book is for. Comforted that you may comfort, mm -hmm, right? Exactly. All right, Jeannie, thank you so Thanks, much for sharing your journey with us. And our prayers are with you and Ben and, and your daughters. Thank Three you. daughters yes. now, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, God bless you. And thank that. you. Parenting's always easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're in this together, all of us. Uh, that's what the important part about dealing with grief is community. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, if we, if we had more time, we could talk about that and, and uh, accepting the way God gives grace in, in the midst of Absolutely. community. It's never all. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Jeannie's journey has been an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.